Hey, what's up? It's Dave from I'mSimplyAdad.com, and you're watching the Happy Healthy Family Podcast. I am very pleased to welcome Dr. Elisa Song to the show today. Uh, she's a holistic pediatrician and uh, basically uh, an expert in functional medicine when it comes to pediatrics. Uh, she has a website and blog called Healthy Kids, Happy Kids, which is a great name, by the way. Uh, Dr. Song, welcome to the Happy Healthy Family Podcast. Thank you, Dave. I'm <laughs> super excited to be here. We've been trying to get this going for a while, so I'm, yeah. I'm really glad it's finally working. <laughs> I'm so pleased that I was, it was hard to narrow down. You're such an expert in everything. I was like, I, just, and I just threw everything at you. I'm like, let's talk about everything. You're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Pulled the reins in on me, so I'm like, okay. That's right. Well, we have plenty of time to talk about uh, other issues on other podcasts, right? There we go. I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, but Dr. Song and I today, we're going to cover um, something called mast cell activation. Um, it's a topic that if you're like me, you've been hearing more and more about, and it seems, you know, mast cell activation, it, you know, it's probably playing a pretty big role in why so many of our kids are sick these days. So I'm curious for you, Dr. Song, um, in your practice, are you seeing a lot more kids come in with these serious chronic health issues? And has it changed, you know, since from when you first started being a pediatrician? Yeah, it, you know, it has changed dramatically. When I finished my pediatrics residency at UCSF, which is one of the top medical centers in the country, if not the world, and, you know, that was back in 2000, and I saw one child with autism in my entire three-year residency training, right, at this quaternary specialty university center. And I was told back then that if I saw a handful of kids with autism in my career, it would be a lot, right? Oh, wow. And now look at where we are. That's I crazy. My There's like a handful in every class now. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. And we know it's such a spectrum, right? But yeah. it's not just a matter of more kids being diagnosed. I mean, when I started my practice in 2004, uh, which it, I started it as a holistic integrative practice. Um, that was just four years after graduating, and it just exploded, you know, with kids on the spectrum needing more help, you know, needing more biomedical help. And way back then, uh, it was called, you know, we were Dan doctors, right? Defeat autism oh, yeah, now. Yeah. That, that's we're no longer allowed to use that term. So we're, you know, we are, uh, use a biomedical approach or a functional medicine approach to kids with autism, but. You know, from there, it just continued to explode with kids with all sorts of chronic illnesses that, you know, residency doesn't really prepare you for because we're we like to think that most of our kids are healthy. But, you know, we have this slow creep. And at this point now, at least 50 percent of all children have some sort of a chronic diagnosis. And it can range from, you know, eczema and asthma to anxiety to autism and ADHD. And I'm seeing so many more kids with autoimmune illnesses, rheumatoid arthritis, um, Hashimoto's in young kids, um, Crohn's disease, celiac disease. And at the trajectory that we're going, you know, we're, we think that by 2025, you know, which is, I mean, Not my gosh, that's like six years away, right? That, that we're projecting that at least eight in 10 kids will have some sort of a chronic condition. Now, some of these conditions are gonna be relatively, quote, mild. Some of them are going to be more severe and devastating, but, but bottom line, they're chronic. I mean, these are not just get a cold or a flu and it goes away. These are things that kids have to live with. And we know that when you have one chronic condition and one autoimmune illness, and eczema and asthma are now considered autoimmune phenomena, when you have one autoimmune reaction or illness, chances are much higher that you're going to develop a second or a third or a fourth autoimmune illness. So, you know, and you said it, right, in, in, in our kids' classrooms, I mean, what child doesn't have sensory issues or behavioral problems or attention problems or autism, whatever, even if they haven't been diagnosed. I mean, I sit in my, my daughter is entering fourth grade. My son is going to enter third grade this fall. And, you know, from the time they started kindergarten, I sit in the class and I volunteer and you just notice how many kids are, have so much trouble being in their bodies, 
right? And being still and being comfortable in their skin, right? I mean, these kids are just, they're, they're not, they're not feeling well, but they don't even realize it because it's been like this their whole life. And so, you know, and what kid, you know, when I go on field trips now, you know, we're carrying bags of EpiPens and inhalers oh, and wow. emergency medications. So the number is skyrocketing. Just look at food allergies, right? True anaphylactic food allergies. So we have now in parents, new parents now are, are coming to expect that this is the, you know, the quote new normal as a lot of people say, but you know, these are, are maybe common conditions, but these are not normal, right? These are not normal for our kids. So, you know, it's really important that, um, you know, dads like you who have podcasts and, <laughs> and, you know, functional medicine practitioners and, you know, people who are, you know, in the trenches really seeing these kids and helping to really get the word out that these are not okay, that we can actually reverse and heal these autoimmune and chronic conditions, and that that it's possible. We need to get that word out because we need to step back to a time where where we realize that kids shouldn't be sick, right? The expectation, the normal, should be that our kids are thriving and healthy, right? Yeah, I think it's worth repeating there. So in just over five years, eighty percent of our kids are going to have some sort of chronic issue that they have to deal with that is just absolutely insane and like really like heart aching really it yeah it is it is and we should we should be you know we should be demanding that you know medicine changes we should be demanding that our food policies change we should be demanding that the government has better controls on you know what goes into our bodies and on our skin you know and it it really will take that uprising and it's starting but it's just not fast enough for our kids right now. So, yeah. you know, it's really going to be up to parents like us and practitioners to, to work with our kids and, and, you know, get them better kind of one step at a time and hopefully continue to contribute to a larger movement. Yeah. And it, it's unfortunate, though, it seems like the powers that be as far as the free flow of information is um, sort of trying to put a damper in, in a foot it, footstep on our on our progress is where you know it's, Facebook it's and Google yep. and all their they're changing up yep. and, and Pinterest and all the changing yep. algorithms it's changing but you know what you know I, I think that the truth can't be held down for long so <laughs> yeah and uh, you know it it got here without the internet so maybe it can continue to you know progress you know I know parents 20, 30 years ago who were doing the gluten-free, casein-free diet for their kid with autism, you know, and that That's was right. like, they were going to the library and picking out these really thick old books and figuring out how to do it, you know. That's right. I can't That's even right. imagine like doing that now. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you have such amazing resources online. I mean, it's crazy to think how, how can parents... I mean, it, on the one hand, it's this incredible opportunity for parents to learn so much about how to, um, you know, be their children's best advocates and, and really um, explore different health options and treatment options um, and connect with community, right? Because, you know, back then, if you were a parent of a child with autism or a child with rheumatoid arthritis or a child with, you know, anxiety, you felt alone, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, you just felt like there was nobody else going through what you were going through and maybe maybe there weren't really any other parents going through the same thing in your local community. But now we have this online community that can really be such a great support. On the other hand, I think, you know, there's so few uh, pediatric practitioners that can really help guide parents. And so, you know, I, it is kind of the wild west a lot of times where you feel yeah. like you're, you know, you don't want to feel like you're experimenting on your child. And so that's, you know, my mission is to really help educate parents and practitioners on what's effective, what's safe, what's what has some science behind it, what maybe doesn't have a lot of science yet, but has some anecdotal evidence that it can be helpful and, and, and you know, has a very low you know, side effect profile. And then you know, hopefully teach more practitioners to be able to do this and help, you know, their kids in their, in their local communities. Yeah. Yeah. We definitely need more, more pediatricians. I know in the, in the St. Louis area, including the surrounding little municipalities, there's one integrative doc. As, yeah. And of course, she has a long waiting list. You know? Yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah, so we need more guys. If, they, if you're a doctor out there or in med school, you know, there's a good thriving yeah. <laughs> area it's, to go in into. Med school, right? Whether you are a uh, in medical residency, if you're an osteopathic school, you know, residency, naturopathic school residency, you know, an acupuncturist, um, chiropractor. I mean, we need more practitioners who really are, are can be knowledgeable and trained in the science behind why 
functional medicine and integrative medicine is so important. I mean, that is going to be the key to our kids' future health. Yeah. Okay. So let's go ahead and pivot to the mast cells because we could go on yeah. about this for a while. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about, like, let's define mast cells first. So what exactly are mast cells and what, what's the purpose of them? So that's a great question. You know, mast cells are a kind of um, blood cell that release histamine in response to a particular trigger. And, you know, mast cells and histamine are not always a bad thing. So we have to remember, um, kind of stepping back to how our immune system works, um, when we are faced with, you know, uh, an insult, an injury, you know, a toxic exposure, our immune system's job is to create inflammation, right? A lot of us think, oh my gosh, get the inflammation down. You know, in conventional medicine, we squash inflammation with, you know, steroids and ibuprofen. Um, and there is a time and a place for that. But if our immune system is working normally, we should be able to create this inflammation. You know, think about a cut on your arm where, you know, it gets a little red at first. That's a recruitment of those immune cells. Uh, mast cells are involved in that inflammatory process and they release histamine. What's one of the roles of histamine? Histamine dilates our blood vessels. And so that allows better blood flow to that area to get all of those great you know, nutrients and, and immune chemicals and other immune cells to go to that area of injury and help out and heal. Now, the other part, role of our immune system is then to understand and recognize when the job of inflammation is done. And then we have this other branch of our immune system that comes, this counter-regulatory part of our immune system that comes and says, hey guys, you know, immune activation, you know, inflammation, you've done your job. Let's go back down to normal baseline and get back to health. Chronic disease happens when this immune response, this inflammation response, doesn't go back to baseline. It's persistent and chronic. So, you know, when we talk about mast cell activation and histamine, you know, there's a lot of information now online. It's become kind of the new buzzword. It seems like everyone has mast cell activation. Um, histamine and mast cells are not a bad thing. We don't want to get rid of all histamine. We don't want to get rid of all mast cells, right? That, that there's a reason why our immune systems have developed to have mast cells. And histamine is an amazing chemical. You know, we have histamine receptors on every single cell in our body and brain, on our immune cells, in our, on our brain cells, um, of course, in our lungs and in our stomach and in our sinuses and our skin. So we know histamine. Most of us know histamine because of the quote, allergy symptoms that we see, um, like runny nose, itchy eyes, hives on the skin, you know, wheezing in the lungs, and reflux. You know, histamine is responsible for creating, uh, releasing more hydrochloric acid from our gastric cells. Um, so, so those are the symptoms that we might see more commonly, but some of the signs that we see that histamine is becoming a problem is when we see these chronic illnesses that are associated uh, or have in common histamine overload and mass activation. And that we see in kids with autism, ADHD, kids with pans and pandas, um, which I talk a lot about, um, asthma, allergies, I mean, any classic uh, histamine related concern, and also autoimmune illnesses. Many, many autoimmune illnesses have underlying in part, a mast cell activation and histamine problem. So mast cells are really important to understand. They can be a good thing, but then when we're chronically overloaded, they're not so good for us. Gotcha. So that inflammatory response you were talking about, is that what you would call the, the cell danger response? So in part, you know, some people, you know, will, will uh, some practitioners will say that, you know, the cell danger response is Dr. Navio's, you know, term for mast cell activation. And it's, uh, you know, it's not that simple. So Dr. Robert Navio, he is at UC San Diego. He is the expert in mitochondrial disorders and this, and he has identified this cell danger response. His work is fascinating. I think that his work is really groundbreaking and really important to get uh, for functional medicine practitioners to really wrap their head around because I think uh, the work that he's doing is going to provide the basis for a lot of our healing opportunities for kids because I'll see kids with, you know, autism or pans or pandas or autoimmune illness and you know you'll get them better and you're like yes you know we're on the right track and then all of a sudden 
things slide back or you have kids where you know you're doing all the right things that have helped other kids but this child is kind of stuck and i think the cell danger response is uh, underlying a lot of that so what is a cell danger response the cell danger response is literally it's our primitive we developed this back in the you know primordial days right primitive cellular response to protect ourselves against a threat and that threat can be chemical um, like glyphosate, you know, Roundup. It can be physical. Um, it can be biological, like an infection, and it can even be psychological. So there are psychological threats too. So this is also where you know, psycho we we know that psychological um, uh, threats can cause as much inflammation and immune dysregulation as anything physical. So we really do need to pay attention to that, you know, body mind connection. Um, so what he described was a healing cycle where in a healthy person, um, we're in the health state, the health cycle where, you know, we have our waking metabolic activities and then we have our sleeping metabolic activities that help us detoxify and regulate and restore. When we're faced with a threat, the cell danger response is triggered, right? And in, in that cell danger response, there are three subsets. And I mean, his work is so um, dense that even I have to read his articles 50 times to just kind of <laughs> every time I'm like, oh, I got another fact, right? So I'm not going to go into the crazy intense metabolic, you know, cascade that happens. But essentially, in these three phases of the cell danger response, um, the, there's a wave of metabolic changes. In the first stage, you have this release of ATP, ATP is really important for my, that's what our mitochondria produce, our cellular energy currency. And uh, we have this release of histamine, right? And so we have then this sort of mitochondrial activation, mast cell activation that occurs in that first stage. And then as we go through uh, the cell danger response, um, we then get um, recruitment of immune cells, we, we neutralize the threat, and then we allow that cell to repair, regenerate, and then go back into the health state, right? So what Dr. Navia has described and is known in many, many chronic illnesses, including autoimmune illnesses, neurodevelopmental and psychiatric illnesses, is that the cell danger response for, for many people will get stuck, right? It's in this stuck state where we see mitochondrial dysfunction, where we see mast cell activation persistence, right? That, that then doesn't allow the immune system and the body to get back into that metabolic state of health and wellness. Um, and so this, if we can understand that, then we can know, all right, even if our, our kids or our adult patients have not been diagnosed with mast cell activation disorder, which is a really hard diagnosis, we know that most of our kids are going to have mast cell activation, right? Most of our kids are going to have mitochondrial dysfunction, and we need to support that if we want to get them back into the healing cycle. So I tell parents, don't get hung up on getting a diagnosis. It does not matter what label you know you put on your what's going on with your kid. What matters is understanding the biochemical imbalances so that we know what supplements and what lifestyle changes can help support those biochemical imbalances um, to get them back into that health cycle and really complete the healing cycle once your child has entered once your child's cells have entered that cell danger response. So if it gets stuck, is it getting stuck or is it more the case that whatever is triggering that cell danger response uh, is still there? So like if it's a toxin or a low-grade chronic infection or mold exposure or something like that? That is such a great question. Such a great question because it actually can be both, right? Sometimes the initial... You know, let's say in pandas, you know, if it was triggered by strep or pans, if it was triggered by Lyme disease, right, um, or influenza, um, sometimes the initial or, you know, Epstein-Barr, sometimes the initial infection, it will actually resolve and killing more and more and more is not necessarily going to be the answer. The answer is going to be to really address the cell danger response and this mitochondrial dysfunction and mast cell activation. On the flip side, you are not going to get into the health state, the health cycle, if you don't, quote, neutralize or get rid of that initial insult. So if you, you're, the strep is still active, if you're still living in a house filled with mycotoxins, you know, if um, you're still, 
you know, eating a lot of food with, with glyphosate, right? The cell danger response is going to stay stuck because you're not allowing that initial trigger to, to release and the cell danger, the cells to say, oh, the threat's neutralized because the threat hasn't been neutralized. So it's actually both. That's a great question. Interesting. Okay. And so then it, that kind of leads to the mitochondrial dysfunction just basically because of like over over activity, like it just gets burnt out or? Yeah, well, yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> because, because mitochondria, you know, mitochondria are, there are cells powerhouses. I love mitochondria. I mean, they're, you know, when you look at, you know, under an electron microscope, they are just beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> that to me, they're like one of the most beautiful organelles, you know, in the cell. Um, and they have two membranes and they have these little squiggles on the inside and along each of these membranes and the squiggles and um, they create, they go through the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle and also the electron transport chain to create ATP. Now, why do we need ATP? Well, it's because our cells need energy to do everything. And so, you know, when I ask parents about and kids themselves about their energy, uh, you know, and I and I say, well, I'm really concerned about mitochondrial dysfunction. A lot of parents and, and kids will say, but I have a lot of energy. I have too much energy sometimes, right? I'm too hyper. So I'm not talking about the energy to get up and, you know, really be, you know, be super kind of active in that way, what I'm talking about is cellular energy. Um, and so what we often see with mitochondrial dysfunction is that you may be able to muster up the strength to do great in your soccer game and run super fast down the field, but you don't have the cellular energy to sustain. So you, you might need to take more breaks while you're playing than your friends. Or after the game where your friends can go home and jump on a trampoline and have another play date, you might be wiped out and just need to stay on the couch and take a 20 minute nap, right? So it's that, that endurance piece. Um, but we also do see fatigue. We see, um, you know, uh, um, muscle weakness, you know, low tone in our kids. Um, we've, you know, mitochondrial dysfunction in kids on the autism spectrum has been described for years and years and years and years. That is not a new, um, new phenomena. Um, but, you know, now as we broaden and see that, you know, some of the same uh, biochemical imbalances that we've identified, you know, through, through, you know, Defeat Autism Now, the Autism Research Institute, um, for kids with autism apply to many, many kids with chronic illness, even if they don't have autism, right? So that's where, like I said, I mean, the diagnosis matters a little because it might help identify some of the pathophysiology that I have to address. But, but the bottom line, we have to look at what's the biochemical imbalance or imbalances that's going on. And so mitochondrial dysfunction, when we think about it, there are lots of signs uh, that can give us a clue that your child has some mitochondrial dysfunction going on. Um, you know, in our babies, you know, you might notice. So some parents, you know, with kids who um, already have a child on the spectrum or a child with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, and they want to know, well, how do I prevent that from happening to my, my next kid? You know, what are some early signs that we might need to jump on, you know, say supporting their mitochondria? So as a baby, if they have a weak suck whether at the breast or the bottle, you know, just you know, the milk is dribbling out, they're just having a hard time latching on. Um, if their head control, you know, when you by four months, if a baby's on their back and you lift them up by their arms, their back and head should stay in line and, sh and they should be uh, be able to sit straight up with support. If their head is bobbing all over the place or lagging, you know, their head's kind of lagging behind their body as you lift them up, that's another sign that tone is not great. Um, you know, there's another sign that, you know, I'll pick up babies by their arm, you know, under their arms and kind of lift them up. And most babies, I mean, they'll, they'll stay in your arms and you feel really secure. But babies who have um, low tone and mitochondrial, possible mitochondrial issues, they feel like they're slipping through your hands. Like you just can't get that good grasp on them. So that's about a baby. But, you know, for older kids, um, there are lots of other tip offs, you know, that, that there might be some mitochondrial issues going on. So one thing is, um, you know, regression when they get sick. Right. You know, everyone feels lousy when they're sick. But if your kids take a long time to recover and they really they get really clumsy or they, um, you know, have trouble and they start slurring, you know, or, you know, they get really, really weak. Um, that's one tip off. Um, 
Other signs are going to be if your child, you know, most toddlers have amazing posture. They can sit with their back nice and straight. So if your child is sitting with a rounded back, even as a toddler, or sitting in that W position where they're on their bottoms they're, and they're, you know, their knee, uh, you know, on their um, legs and their feet are splayed out. So their knees are in front of them. So their legs are making a W position, um, a weak pencil grasp, you know, persistent drooling. So there are some other signs that, you know, that I, t I look at for kids, you know, see, do they have mitochondrial dysfunction? And why is that important to know? You know, so even, in, even if I don't do any blood work or urine testing, because some parents may not have access to that either, um, supporting mitochondria can be really, really beneficial, right? You know, let's say children who are receiving, you know, medications or um, uh, or have infections that we know can stress out the mitochondria. You know, and you notice that wow, they're 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 slumping forward even more, or they they can barely pick up their backpack even you know even if before like before they got sick they were fine. We can give them mitochondrial supports like. CoQ10 or carnitine or ribose and our methylated B vitamins, all the things that can support mitochondrial function. So that's kind of mitochondria in a nutshell, but I, that is uh, really, really common to see in, in kids with any sort of chronic condition. So I definitely look at that closely for our kids. Now, you gave us some, some examples of uh, dysfunction or things to be aware of if our, if our young kids are showing signs of, of dysfunction. Is there like signs for older kids or, or adults even like that, that they have mitochondrial yeah. dysfunction? Yeah. And you know, um, absolutely. Because, you know, mitochondrial dysfunction, we know, we know that as we age, um, sadly, you know, anytime after about <laughs> maybe 25 or so, <laughs> our, our mitochondria become depleted. And you know, we just are, you can tell your muscle mass is starting to decrease, you get a little weaker. Um, but so these same signs you will notice in, a, in teenagers and adults. So you're going to look at um, energy, you're going to look at endurance is really important. Um, your muscle strength, so grasp, you know, opening up having a hard time opening up cans or, you know, turning, turning doorknobs. Um, if they have, you can sometimes feel that that muscle mass is not that strong, um, or you can, you know, you just feel kind of squishy, right? And that it's getting worse, right? Even if you're exercising, hard time building up muscles. Constipation can be a sign. Constipation can be a sign of, of a lot of things. And the number one thing for kids is, and adults is going to be, <clears throat> excuse me, hydration and magnesium, you know, deficiencies. Um, but that can be because because your anal sphincter muscle tone is low and can be really hard to push out those stools. Mm -hmm. um, hyper mobility, so hyper flexibility of the joints can also be another tip off that there's some mitochondrial dysfunction going on. Um, and, and for my older kids in the office, what I also see is even for those older kids, they'll, they're sitting with their rounded backs as I'm listening to them and I'll, I'll take my hands on their chest and their back and just lift them up and say, okay, let's sit up nice and tall so I can listen to your lungs. And they have a really hard time maintaining that posture. Their core muscle strength just doesn't allow them to sit up nice and tall. So they, they immediately go back to a round and back because that's really fatiguing for them. Interesting, yeah. I, <clears throat> as you were talking about the the loss of muscle and just feeling squishy, I it was like kind of describing me a little bit like about seven, eight months ago, you know, and, and the years, you know, ex exceeding that. But um, I could feel like I just didn't feel strong. It's not like I, I was like had bony arms or anything like that, you know. But I was just like, I don't feel strong. And I was like really struggling. Open up the pickle jar, you know, you know, the wife yeah. asks you to open the pickle jar. And you don't want <laughs> her to see you struggle. You know? <laughs> and I'm like, man, why can't I open things anymore? Yeah. And thankfully, you know that, and like I've, I've, you know, continued to, to try to improve my health. And, and the, I feel stronger now is what I'm trying to say. And yeah. so I yeah. wonder if there was a little bit of, of dysfunction in my, in my mitochondria and needed, you know, some support. Yeah, I don't you know, know what particularly gets, I may have done that would have helped. <laughs> well, you know, mitochondria gets stressed really easily. I mean, even just with psychological stress, your mitochondria gets stressed. And, you know, just as we age, all of us, you know, need mitochondrial supports. The cellular signs of aging are associated with mitochondrial depletion. And, you know, we used to think that, you know, maybe you were born with all the mitochondria you're going to have. And the interesting very interesting fact is that your mitochondrial DNA are really the only DNA in your body that are 100% inherited just from your mom. I mean, there's some evidence that maybe there's a slight paternal, but that you will receive your mitochondrial DNA from your mother. So if you, if as a mom, you also have signs of mitochondrial 
weakness or dysfunction, um, there's a high likelihood that your, your child is going to as well. Um, and the, one of the best ways as an adult to really maintain our mitochondrial functioning, even as a teenager, is actually weight-bearing exercises and weightlifting. So focusing more on weightlifting and, and um, um, weight-bearing exercises as we get older is actually even more important than focusing on cardio because your muscle, you can build more mitochondria and, and your mitochondria are going to be housed, you know, the, you build them through skeletal muscle, right? And so, you know, just strength training is, is phenomenal and I think that should be a part of every, every adult's routine. Uh, and then for kids, as they start to get older, they can participate in strength training exercises too. Nice. So does, does, mitochondrial dysfunction automatically equal mast cell activation? So that's an interesting question. Um, not necessarily, right? Because mitochondria can get hit just by themselves. Um, I would say ver they very often will go together as I look more and more. Um, I, I'll see evidence of mast cell activation and um, mitochondrial dysfunction hand in hand. And I think, you know, this idea of mast cell activation, you know, back when, you know, I, I trained in the um, biomedical approach to autism and, and, you know, became a Dan doctor, we didn't really talk about mast cell activation and histamine that much. It's really been a relatively new thing. I mean, this was, I, you know, I trained what, 18 years ago, right? And um, and so when we think about mast cells and histamine, that's really the information there is really burgeoned over the last three, four, five years maybe, maybe less even. Um, and so I, I wasn't, I don't know that if it was that, that my kids back then didn't have mast cell activation or I just wasn't really looking for it. But now I do, I will, you know, check now for my kids with chronic illnesses, I check for something called dermographism, which is something that you can do at home. Um, so dermographism, so dermo skin, graphism to write, and literally you on, on your on your or your child's forearm, you can, t I'm going to do this in the camera just in case this is going to be on video, <laughs> but you can on their form with your fingernail, just write their name, right? Or whatever you want. You can write love, right? So, uh, but here I'll write Alisa, right? And then, you know, if you scratch with your nail, you, I mean, you might see a little white, whitish at first. I mean, my skin's pretty dry. But then, you know, within a few minutes, you shouldn't be able to see where you've written. For kids and adults who have mast cell activation, and try this, if you have really bad seasonal allergies, you know, hay fever and you're sniffling and sneezing, we know there's a lot of histamine in your body, try it because then what happens if you have a lot of histamine in your body, um, histamine creates hives, so you will see the outline of whatever you've written on the forearm in kind of a whitish, then pink and swollen, and it looks like a hive. And so, uh, and so that's called dermographism, and that's a sign of histamine um, you know, overload in your system. So it's an easy thing that you can check to see. And, you know, histamine and mast cell activation is not a constant. I mean, there are going to be days where it's worse, days where it's, it's you know, not as bad, uh, just like with mitochondria. You know, if you have mitochondrial dysfunction, but it's a really lazy, mellow day and you're just kind of hanging out and you're drinking a lot of water and eating lots of good fruits and vegetables, your mitochondria are going to be pretty happy. But if it's a day where you're on the go, not able to, you know, you didn't get as much sleep because you had a lot of work to do, um, you're not eating that well because you're picking up fast food and, and you didn't get to exercise that day and you're starting to get a cold, well, you are, your mitochondria are going to really feel stressed. And then that's when you're going to feel more symptoms. Interesting. That's such a cool tip. I wonder how many people stopped where they were doing a sort of scratching on their skin. <laughs> <laughs> I know when my son gets home, I want to like try that. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, such an easy tip. So it's it's going to turn like red and hivey as opposed to like just if you're like dehydrated, it would just That's be like white, right? Or yeah, and just or just gone. Like you know, now on my arm, I can't even see where I where I scratch myself. Right, it's just gone. I mean, you're not scratching super hard. Right, right, you're just right, right. kind of you know writing on the skin. Um, so and that you know that you know if you're uh, you know if you want to know what other signs to look for for histamine because there are some other signs that you can look for besides dermographism. That's just a really easy um, you know thing that you can do anytime. Uh, and uh, and so the other tip offs might be. I mean, of course, we're looking at the actual, you know, 
classic allergy signs. So if your child has a history of eczema or asthma or hives or hay fever, of course they have histamine overload. But some of the signs that are going to be a little less obvious that you can look for um, is facial flushing. So a lot of times parents will notice, wow, their cheeks get so bright red, their ears get bright red, and they get overheated, right? Just being out, you know, in the hot sun and walking and they are wiped out and they're super bright red. So that's another possible histamine sign. Um, if their heart rate, now not, you know, a lot of parents don't necessarily check your kid's heart rate frequently, but uh, but I do listen. And so if they're tachycardic, if their heart rate's a bit elevated, that can be another sign. Um, kids who actually do worse on uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medicines like ibuprofen or naproxen. These are aspirin in the same family of uh, medications like aspirin. And we know that kids with histamine and salicylate sensitivity um, can have uh, can be more sensitive to histamines. Um, Kids who, and adults who do worse on fermented foods, you know, I, I love my sauerkraut, I love my kombucha, but you know, if, if you have a family saying, oh, they just can't tolerate it, they get super itchy or, you know, super flushed or, you know, behavioral problems, headaches, um, headaches are a big one to look for and dizziness, just that um, uh, kind of blood pressure shifting quite a bit in the histamine, because remember what histamine does, histamine one of the things is it dilates blood vessels. It makes your blood vessels bigger, so that might drop your blood pressure. It causes the blood to rush to the surface of your skin, so your face gets flushed. Very interesting. And so does it make you feel like feverish, but without a fever? It can, yeah. I mean, I have kids, I mean, they're just so hot. I had this one kid the other day, I mean, she was having this sort of histamine episode. And um, I mean, she, she asked me if I had any ice packs. So she put ice packs on her on her face and you know I had a fan in my room and we pointed a fan straight at her feet you know because she was just so hot all over um, so yeah you can definitely feel that hmm, interesting see I get these I randomly will get like hot but I'm not hot to the touch and I'm like yeah. I wonder like what what is causing that yeah, that flushed feeling. You know, when you when you feel that next, you should try that that dermographism trick. Hey, you there know, you just go. There you go. Um, the other thing that a lot of parents don't associate with histamine is uh, is reflux. So just being nauseous, you know, having some reflux symptoms. Um, because as I mentioned before, our, our stomach cells have histamine receptors. The recept histamine receptors on our skin and our lungs um, that are that cause asthma and eczema and hives are. Um, are histamine type one receptors, but our stomach cells have histamine type two receptors that, again, when histamine attaches, they'll release hydrochloric acid. So, um, so uh, adults and kids, if you're having reflux, um, it, it, it is a histamine issue, but I see many, many kids with eczema or hay fever, and during their big flares, they're having a lot of tummy aches. And, you know, because the histamine is not specific for the skin, it's going to go attached to any receptor that's available. Um, so they may have more reflux symptoms when they're in the height of their flare, whether it's a pans flare or whether it's a, um, an asthma flare or eczema flare. Interesting. So the symptoms seem to, like concentrate more on the the areas that are more susceptible to we'll call infection or invasion i guess is that right so like it the, the mast cells are more concentrated in the, on the skin and then the lungs and then the gut you know where our immune system is more concentrated is that right and that's yeah, why we but see you know, these symptoms um, there yes Yes, but we also have, you know, mast cells that are involved in in many many different uh, reactions that are and and histamine receptors in, you know, as I mentioned, our brain. You know, histamine is considered a neurotransmitter, uh, which is why, um, you know, for people with histamine problems and mast cell activation, headaches and and sort of you know, emotional lability and behavioral changes can be a, a feature. Um, and also on all of our organs too. Um, so there, there's, I mean, histamine can do so many different things. It's, it's such a wide reaching um, uh, chemical that, that, you know, we want to now having this knowledge, we want to think, hmm, could histamine be involved? You know, when you have a kid with any sort of a chronic health issue. Interesting. Okay. So that brings up a thought of my mind is this is like the number one problem I've been having with my son over the past almost a year now good lord um, is and we can't figure out what exactly he wants so he has severe autism and he has very limited communication skills he's not nonverbal but he's limited verbal mm -hmm. and he the back of his head like right here 
he'll always ask for honey, which is his word for essential oils. <laughs> which, oh, I so love we, it. We put the, we put oils on whenever he gets a scratch or you know a bug bite or something like that. So he calls it honey. And so he's like, honey, 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 you know, point to his head and like he'll go to like the essential oil cabinet and try to put it on the back of his head. (laughs) Nice. But when or, you know, he'll take our hand and he'll have to scratch it really hard. And there's no sign at all that there's any sort of rash or anything because I've cut his hair like super short so I could get a good look at it. Mm -hmm. And nothing seems to help. And like so eventually this will spark like this really behavioral meltdown. He'll start pounding the back of his head and, you know, he'll, he'll jump in the shower, stick his head in the shower to try to get water on it to try to make it feel better. And so we don't know if it itches or if it tingles or if it burns or, or if it's just a headache or what it is. So is, is mast cell something that we need to address? Is it histamine? And so we've, we've had him on quercetin to try to address the histamine. Sometimes it seems to work. Sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. So yeah. How, how is that, uh, are we on the right track with histamines and mast cells or, or could it be yeah, something Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I would definitely, um, you know, I would say, you know, quercetin is a, a great mast cell stabilizer. Um, you know, the, the the two best ones that I the two main mast cell stabilizers. So what does that mean? Um, it's it's sta- it stabilizes the membrane of the mast cell, the cell membrane. So that you know, let's say you have a virus or a pollen um, that attaches to that histamine receptor on that mast cell, it's more stable, so it doesn't just explode with histamine really easily. So so we definitely want to have quercetin or um, luteolin on board to reduce the amount of histamine that's being released on a day-to-day basis. Um, but when we're in that big like histamine state, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, a, a lot of my kids will call them episodes, right? A histamine episode. Um, then using an actual antihistamine to mop up the, the Benadryl that's floating around is also really important. So that's where, you know, adding on trying like a Benadryl or Zyrtec or Claritin and just noticing, okay, wow, our, you know, our behavior is more calm. You know, is there less of that whatever sensation he's feeling, whether it's hot or itchy or prickly or whatever? Um, So I might, you know, uh, typically you need a kind of a a two-pronged approach. When histamine levels are are stable, when you've brought them down and they're pretty, you know, manageable, that's where, you know, quercetin and luteal and and other things too, um, like, um, I mean, there are things like ketotifin that can be helpful, but those keep things at bay. But the f- first part is really getting getting rid of the extra free floating histamine. Does that make sense? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, and it's actually like we've done all that. <laughs> so we had him on Benadryl, and we had him on a regular, I believe it was Zyrtec, and it didn't really seem to to help him at all. It did at first, and then it it kind of stopped. So I don't know if that yeah it was just needed a higher dose or well you or know maybe so, it, so it then, just wasn't histamine oh. well if it helped a little <laughs> if it helped a little bit that then yes then i'd say there probably is there is some histamine involved and so you know quercetin is such a great antioxidant anyway so yeah. you know maintaining that but then looking at okay well now what other pieces i'm sure your son's already on mitochondrial support so okay let's make sure we beef up those mitochondrial supports um and then looking at are there still some triggers for the cell danger response Right. And looking at, you know, are there, um, you know, are, is there are there mycotoxins involved? Are there some infections that we haven't identified? Are there um, some chemicals in the classroom that, you know, we haven't identified? So then figuring out, you know, what other sources, what other triggers for that cell danger response are so that we can help get those cells out of that loop. Yeah. And I kind of suspect it's all of the above with my son. So, yeah. Oh. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's unfortunately it's <laughs> never just it's never just one thing. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So go ahead and and give us some more of those uh, mitochondrial supports since you just brought it up. So you said earlier it was like things like ribose and what else did you say? You said a few things earlier. Yeah. So you know, um, there's uh, there's mitochondrial and mast cell supports, right? Because we want to do both, yeah. right? Now the mitochondrial supports. I mean, the, the top mitochondrial support that I'll use is CoQ10. Um, 
coenzyme Q10 is one of the important cofactors for the citric acid cycle, right? So you just, um, it's just part of helping your, your mitochondria produce more ATP. Bottom line, we want more ATP because what happens in the, um, uh, in the cell danger response, your cells leak ATP, right? So the more we can build ATP, the better. So, um, CoQ10, ribose, um, you know, is another uh, supports mitochondria and carnitine. Carnitine can be very helpful for mitochondria as well. Um, your methylated B vitamins are important. It's also really important to get in those good antioxidants, right? You know, we're thinking eating that colorful rainbow of fruits and vegetables. And if your kids are not, you know, um, eating a wide variety, then then uh, getting in those antioxidants like vitamin C, vitamin A, vitamin E, and glutathione. And why is that important when your mitochondria are stressed? Because mitochondria, when, when, when our immune system is stressed, um, it, we create a lot of what are called free radicals, right? Or oxidative stress. And we need a lot a lot of mitochondrial support and antioxidant support to um, get rid of the oxidative stress. So really beefing up the antioxidants, whether it's from food or from supplements, is really important if we want to support our mitochondria. Now, what about like supplemental ATP? Are you a fan of that at all? You know, I haven't, I haven't used supplemental ATP. Um, so, so I, I don't know. I have, have you tried it? Uh, we tried it once a long time ago. Didn't really notice anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I, I haven't tried it. I've, you know, I've used more of the cofactors because then that can help your cells, you know, make more. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So as far as CoQ10, do you use just a certain form of CoQ10, like ubiquinol or anything like that? Yeah, I do use the ubiquinol because that's okay. the more active, um, more active form. I mean, the, the less we um, ask our cells to do, the better, <laughs> right? So, you know, the activated form of CoQ10, also the methylated form of the B vitamins, right? Just so that you're you're um, helping to bypass any steps that might be a little stressed, you know, at a cellular level for your kids. Okay, so that was just for mitochondrial support, or is that That's kind of a double? Support. Okay, so how um, do we support we th the mast cell? Yeah, so when we think about the mast cell, so. Um, you know, we want, there are some medications, right? Like your antihistamines like Benadryl, Quercetin, Zyrtec, you know, it really, um, they're not all the same, right? They have different, different activities, even though they're all H1 blockers. So just trying and seeing, you know, which one might have the better effect. Um, a ranitidine or Zantac is an H2 blocker. So sometimes I'll add that on. Although I really, you know, the gut is so important, right? You know, gut health is everything for our kids who are sick um, and adults who are sick. So I worry about shifting, you know, the the pH balance too much with Zantac because we know that ranitidine has been associated with, with gut dysbiosis just as much as antibiotics. But, but sometimes we need it, right, when we're trying to kind of control the um, histamine. Um, there are other, you know, I mentioned quercetin as a mast cell stabilizer, Luteolin is really helpful. There's something called Chinese skull cap, which is totally different than uh, American skull cap. It's Chinese skull cap or Baikalin skull cap um, has been found to help with mast cell stabilization. There's DAO enzymes, so diamine oxidase, that will help break down histamine in your gut and prevent um, histamine from being absorbed uh, through, into your bloodstream. That can make a huge difference, you know, for a lot of my kids. Um, there are, I, I do use homeopathic medicines a lot, and some of your listeners may not be as familiar with homeopathic medicines, but it's a different category of, um, of medicines and uh, of natural medicines, right? So homeopathic remedies, some people will call them. So homeopathic apis mellifica and homeopathic histaminum, um, which are found in these little blue tubes by Boiron, you know, French company, um, that you can easily find at Whole Foods and most health food stores. But these homeopathically prepared apis mellifica and histaminum was actually found in the laboratory to stabilize um, degranulation, right? These, the release of histamine from these immune cells. Um, and so, so that's where, you know, that also can be super helpful. Um, and can you take those, both of those together? You can, absolutely. Okay. Yep. And the great thing about homeopathic medicines, I'm such a huge fan, as you know. <laughs> I mean, I use them for when kids are sick and when kids have chronic illnesses, is that the homeopathic medicines, no matter what other medications or supplements or, you know, 
exposures your kids have, there's no interaction with other herbs and dietary supplements and medications. Um, so I, I love using homeopathic medicines. It's just not not many um, functional medicine practitioners will be familiar with using homeopathic medicines, but if they are, great. It's a great adjunct. Um, CBD, CBD can also stabilize mast cells, but then, you know, CBD has a lot of other benefits and I'm not an expert in CBD, but, uh, but some kids will benefit from that. Um, uh, ketodophin and gastrochrom are medications that sometimes I'll use. And then the other thing that you want to look at is diet. You know, for some of our kids who are super sensory, super picky, you know, manipulating the diet may be a lot more challenging. However, if you can really focus on uh, reducing those high histamine foods, sugar will trigger histamine release like crazy, right? So reducing the sugars, any of those artificial flavors, dyes and preservatives, which if you have kids on the spectrum, kids with ADHD, kids with behavioral problems, please get off those anyway, <laughs> you know, regardless of the histamine, because that can make such a, such a big difference for their brains. Um, but you can look up online, you know, high histamine foods or his, foods that trigger histamine um, and there's different lists and it's not like you're, you have to be on zero histamine foods but um, but minimizing them right so if your kids have had a bunch of strawberries and maybe not give them chips and guacamole at the same time because avocados and strawberries can both cause you know histamine release um, and then also focusing on foods that are high in quercetin because yes quercetin is a natural compound that's found in herbs like st. John's wort but it's also found in lots and lots of foods so um, you know, raw onions, apples, the skin of red apples, grapes, you know, kale, spinach. And a spinach is an interesting one because spinach actually can cause histamine release, but also has, is high in histamine, but also high in quercetin. So there's that balance there. Um, green tea, decaffeinated green tea. I love green tea for our kids because, um, the theanine in green tea is very calming to the nervous system um, and can help reduce excess levels of GABA, you know, which are off, uh, not GABA, glutamate, glutamate excess yeah. levels of glutamate, <laughs> right? Um, that are excitotoxin, a neurotoxin that can cause a lot of, uh, you know, erratic brain activity. Um, so those are just some tips for, I mean, a lot of tips, right? So there's a lot of things you can try. I'm not suggesting you do everything all at once, but if you suspect uh, mast cell issues, then maybe try. I, I, I think focusing on food uh, is really, really important if you can. And, you know, trying things like quercetin and luteolin are also can be really, really helpful. All of these can be. I typically start with quercetin and luteolin uh, and, you know, homeopathic apis mellifica, you know, but, uh, but again, that's where I start. Doesn't mean that you have to start there. Nice. I, I think I'm definitely going to go run out to the store and try those homeopathics for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I know you have to run, so I'm going to try and, and finish up here pretty quickly. So I want to ask you about uh, one more thing before we move on. Uh, how do you feel about LDA or low dose? Um, what is it? Immunotherapy. Immunotherapy, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know what? I, I just don't have that much experience with it. Mm -hmm. And I actually have heard uh, Dr. Vincent speaking and I've looked at his um, at his trainings. Um, I do have fellow practitioners who have really good results with uh, with um, with LDI and LDA. Uh, but I just I can't speak to particular um successes because so it's not I don't something have that's you in your everyday tool toolkit it's not okay it's not yeah that's fair you don't have to be an expert <laughs> in everything <laughs> <laughs> okay so before i let you go i have my last question that i ask everyone three practical things that um, any parent can do to improve the health and happiness of their family three things that that parents can do to increase the health and happiness of their family. So the first thing I think is to slow down, like slow it way down. I think that, you know, our lives, our kids' lives are crazy. And if you have a special needs kids, I get that, you know, you're going from school to therapies to, you know, whatever else it is, doctor's visits, and it can get really, really crazy, but really trying to figure out what can you drop from your schedule and your kid's schedule so that you can have more downtime and more together time. Um, and because that, you know, as I mentioned before, psychological stress can trigger that um, cell danger response. And, um, you know, the, this, if we could just harness the power of 
slowing down, activating our vagus nerve, you know, we would have so much healing. So I'd say that is one of the most important things that we can do. Um, I really, really think, you know, focusing on the food. I mean, food truly is medicine. So, you know, if your kids are super picky and not don't have a wide palate yet, um, don't give up. I mean, a lot of times that's associated with zinc insufficiency or zinc deficiency, but um, but really treating food as medicine, just the highest quality ingredients for your kids and for you, um, you know, really uh, making sure that you're trying to get in as much of that rainbow as possible. It really, really does make a difference um, and kind of tagging along with that, you know, really trying to have at least one family meal. The power of family meals for our kids, uh, you know, has been researched for decades. I mean, it's fascinating. There's research that, you know, family meals lead to higher happiness and, um, you know, higher health, you know, better health levels, even decreases the rates of teenage anxiety and, and, and pregnancy. <laughs> so, you know, you just, you can't, you, but that also goes on with slowing down, right? Because yeah, so many of us yeah. are on the go and we don't have, we just, I mean, your kids are eating first and then you're eating after, and then we're just rushed. So, um, and then, you know, the, the third thing that I wish that all families could do, um, Again, you know, it's interesting because all of these really go back to that kind of mind, body, mind. But if you could really learn to be mindful together, you know, have a meditation practice together, um, you know, a mindfulness practice together. And that can sound like, oh, I'm not going to do that. My kids aren't going to do that. But it doesn't, I, I don't even call it mindfulness or meditation. Or my kids know those terms because they learn about it in school. But, you know, the, the one thing you could do is, is to learn how to breathe together, you know, look up belly breathing, look up diaphragmatic breathing, and just, you know, bedtime or at the dinner table, wherever it is, take five minutes to really, really focus on your breath and do those big, deep belly breaths, because that, it's not just to get relaxed. At a cellular level, that deep belly breathing will activate your vagus nerve. It reduces uh, histamine. It, re it, you know, it reduces stress on the mitochondria. I mean, literally that, I mean, it's free, right? You can do it anytime. And it might even have more impact on keeping your kids well and getting them well than any of the supplements we can throw you know, throw at your child, which we will need in the beginning. But, you know, what I, what I always am looking for is, okay, we can, we can maybe get our kids well and kind of get them to the point where we're like, wow, they're doing really well, but how do we keep them there? Right. How do we keep them there? Not just, you know, literally hold our breath, right. For the next shoe to drop and for the next flare to happen. I love that. And notice like nothing was, you know, medical or supplement or vitamin. It was slow down, eat healthy as a family and, you know, be mindful as a family. So I love all three of those. That's great. Uh, I know you have an appointment, so I'm going to let you go and I'll go ahead and close up shop and I uh, okay. hope you get to your next appointment on time. Thank I you will. For, for right outside the us. door. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. Uh, thanks all for right. being here. You guys have a good one. Yeah, thanks, Dave. This was great. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Goodbye.